Furthermore, our pattern recognition systems err on the side of being overactive rather than underactive. This is called apophenia. It is alarming to look at a face and not see it immediately as a face. It's quite common, on the other hand, to see a face in an array of leaves or shadows. When we look at the world around us, we instinctively see more than faces. We also, quote, see kindred conscious beings. Humans and some intelligent animals have developed a capacity called theory of mind. We not only have minds, we imagine that others have them, and we think about what they might be thinking. To guess what someone else might do or influence what they might do, it is tremendously helpful to anticipate what they want and what they intend. Theory of mind is so important in navigating our way through society that we can think about it several steps removed. I can imagine what Brian is thinking about how Grace intends to respond to Janet's preferences. Furthermore, because our brains process information about minds differently than information about bodies, we can imagine human minds inside of all kinds of bodies. Think of stuffed animals, pet rocks or cartoon characters. Or, without any body at all, think of evil spirits, poltergeists, or God. Because our theory of mind is so rich, we tend to over-attribute events to conscious beings. Scientists call this hyperactive agency detection. What does that mean? It means that when good things happen, somebody gets credit. And when bad things happen, we look for somebody to blame. We expect important events to be done by, for, and to persons, and are averse to the idea that stuff just happens. We also tend to overassume conscious intent, that if something consequential happened, someone did it on purpose. This set of default assumptions explains why the ancients thought that volcanoes and plagues must be the action of gods. Even in modern times, we are not immune from this kind of attribution. For some Christians, Hurricane Katrina happened because God was angry about abortions and gays. The Asian tsunami happened because he was disgusted with nude Australian sunbathers. The earthquake in Japan because Japanese needed to get right with God. If gods are tweaking natural events, then we want to curry their favor. Around the world, people make special requests known to gods or spirits by talking to them and giving them gifts. Athletes huddle in prayer before a game, just in case those random bounces aren't random. After a good day at the casino, a thank you tip may go into the offering basket. Or maybe that offering goes into the basket beforehand. All of this builds on the idea that gods or other supernatural beings are akin to us psychologically. They have emotions and preferences. They take action in response to things they like and dislike. They experience righteous indignation and crave retribution. They like some people better than others. They respond to our loyalty by being loyal to us. They can be placated or cajoled. They like praise, affirmation, and gratitude. They track favors and goodwill in a kind of tit-for-tat reciprocity. Abstract theologies are a fairly recent invention in the history of human religion, and they tend not to govern religious behavior. Even people who describe their God as omniscient or who insist that everything is predestined often behave as if they need to communicate their desires and can influence future events by doing so. There are exceptions. An increasing number of Christians have moved beyond the concept of a person God to a sense of mystical transcendence, participation in a divine reality that is made manifest in small particulars throughout the universe. They believe that God's power is brought into human lives more through our actions than through supernatural interventions. But most people still prefer the tangible familiarity of a powerful person who watches over them and answers their prayers. 
If the structure of our minds predisposes us to certain kinds of religious beliefs, it also precludes others. Nowhere in the world is there a supernatural being who exists only on alternate Tuesdays, or who sees everything but forgets it all in 10 minutes, or who rewards us for ignoring and disobeying him. Nowhere is there a God who knows the future, but only the next hour, or a God who stars people to death whenever he is pleased with them, or who is exactly like an ordinary person in every way. Some ideas are simply not interesting to us. They may be counterintuitive in ways that make them forgettable instead of sticky. Maybe they don't make good stories, or maybe we don't have good places to file them in our catalog of memories. According to Pascal Boyer, a good religious concept must strike a, quote, minimally counterintuitive balance between being interesting and expected it must activate an existing ontological category, let's say river, add some counterintuitive tag, for example, when dark and bubbling the river turns to blood and heals people, and retain the default assumptions of the category except those that are otherwise specified. The river is wet, flows, is longer than it is wide, has a bottom, and so forth. So we start with a familiar class of being or object then tweak it to pique our interest, but leave intact our basic assumptions about the kind of object or being that it is. If the supernatural thing we are discussing is a conscious being, it needs to have a basically human mind, but with some quirk or special ability. Only under these conditions will it stick and get passed from one person to another. Traditional Christian beliefs are highly successful at getting retained and transmitted. They fit our information processing structures and yet are counterintuitive in intriguing ways. They capitalize on our tendency to attribute events to human-like causal agents who have minds much like our own. They allow us to take machinery that is designed for processing social information and apply it to the problems of understanding inanimate objects and natural phenomena. They leverage our tendency to see patterns in ambiguous or random events. Consequently, they are intuitive and broadly applicable and easily remembered. But if our brains allow for a wide range of religious concepts, how come so many people believe exactly the same thing? And what makes them so sure that those ideas are not only interesting, they are true? As we shall see in coming segments, Christian beliefs don't just fit our mental categories, they also leverage powerful emotions and social relationships so as to become the core reality for those who believe. <laughs>